These videos are brought to you by MSCCasino.com and the Maco Sporting Club. MSCCasino.com, check it out. You are watching Sports Matters TV. Okay guys, welcome to Sports Matters TV. We're in the Metropole Hotel here in Cork and we'd like to thank them for having us for a great interview. Um, I'm joined by um, an RTE grid, a sporting grid, um, you know, the voice of the gas, I always say. Um, I was lucky enough to study under Jur many, many years ago in CSN College. And um, I used to take the notes down quite well. Um, I'd like to mark as well, this is the 725th interview on the Sportsman's platform. And we're absolutely honoured to have Jur Cannon with us here today. So Jur, first of all, I have to mention, you're a St. Finbar's man. They had a great victory over the they weekend. Had. They did, had. did you get a chance to attend or did you obviously... I was unfortunately working elsewhere and couldn't get to it. But um, I saw the highlights of it last night. I was trying to follow it on my phone as well. Uh, I'll get there for the football in two weeks' time and making sure that I'm off that particular Sunday. Uh, it's a fantastic performance by them. Um, mind you, Jerry, I'm not 100% sure that the game itself... I don't know how it finished because yeah. clearly were mon monsoon conditions. We were hearing, we've been hearing since the weekend, since the match, about how the roads were absolutely swamped with rain. It's the Venice of the South, but, you know, highly unsuitable for playing good hurling or good anything. But full credit to them. 29 years is an awful long time to wait. Jerk Cunningham is a fantastic manager. They've got brilliant players. And I think it augurs well, not just for the Bars, but for Cork. Because when the bars are good, Cork are normally very good as well, you know. Most definitely. And like it's a long time coming. Look, we know the history of, of the Bears. I know my old teacher in the, in the North Man, Donalo Grady, the great Bears man. It was a long time coming, but now look, the talks of a double jar, that could be incredible for Cork. Yeah, I think they were a bit worried talking to one or two of them uh, in the build up that uh, they might get nothing uh, after two getting to two finals to come away from all of that empty handed would have been shocking. They've had good enough chance in the football final. Um, they're up against Nemo, uh, they don't have the Castlehaven fellas with them, but uh, the problem will be, of course, um, the ch fact that you're expecting a large number of players to perform well uh, in both codes, in both finals, and that's a big, big undertaking, you know? Most definitely. Now, Joe, we have to talk about the early days, because obviously, look, growing up, we all knew who you were. Obviously, in college, I was a, a big fan of yours, never said it, but look, obviously, studying oh, on you was fantastic. but. Tell us about the early Jerk Cannon, the early days growing up. So where did you grow up? And obviously we're going to get to the teenage days then as well. Obviously that's a big thing. Well, I grew up in Douglas. Um, my father and mother weren't Cork people. My father came from Limerick. My mother was from West Clare. Uh, they met in Limerick. He got a promotion in his job in CIE, and moved to Cork, bought a piece of land in Douglas and built a house. He actually built the house himself. Um, this would have been in the late 1940s. Uh, his first wife tragically died of uh, tuberculosis, TB, leaving him with a, a daughter, a two-year-old daughter, when his wife died. So they, they came to Cork. He built the house. He actually built pretty much all the furniture in the house as well. He was very, very handy with his hands, very, very clever man. Uh, I have got none of those skills, unfortunately. He died when I was seven. So I, I never learned anything, so I can't even drive a nail straight. But uh, I admire what he was able to do. Definitely. And obviously, look, did you have, did you have a passion for sports earlier on? Because, look, obviously, we know Cork is, you know, the history in Cork is incredible for sports. What, what did you kind of take a look into from the early days as a kid? Well, I had an, uh, an older sister, as I say, uh, from my father's first marriage. Uh, she was 12 years older than me. So from the time I was 8, 9, 10 years of age, she was so much older again and, in fact, went to England. That left my mother and myself together. Uh, living in this house in Douglas. So sport became the main passion, the main outlet. Uh, I loved everything and anything about sport. There was a soccer pitch just up the road from us, and then the hurling and football field in Douglas was just beyond that again. So they largely became the playgrounds when you're a kid. Um, Saturday afternoon, if there was nothing on, I was listening to BBC Radio, and suddenly, from a little place in Douglas, I was transported to Old Trafford and to Anfield, listening to some great commentaries. Uh, and, you know, passion, the passion there for sport developed. Sunday was pretty much always GAA, because there was always something happening. So if you were, if you were living on your own, uh, like I was, and growing up as a kid, to a large extent, you know, in a household where there were no other children, 
you're looking for companions. So your friends out in the neighborhood, they were all playing hurling and football and everything else. I even played cricket at one stage with one of the neighbors. Uh, so sport was so critically important in my sanity, I suppose, as a kid growing up. Um, I just loved everything about it. I, I regret it on Sunday nights when there were no matches because <laughs> in the summertime you're just longing for somewhere to go where there's a crowd of people. Yeah. You know, that's the thing about, you know, if you're growing up on your own with just one parent. Um, other houses in the neighborhood, they have two or three children. There's a dad and there's a mom. There's a, there's a, there's a family there. But you're dying to be part of a family. So sport became that. And when I went out to the park, the old athletic grounds, or when I went to Turner's Cross or Flower Lodge to watch matches, you became part of a community. And they were your family, largely. The fans that you uh, stood side by side with and cheered on your home team, you know? And that's why sport played an enormous role in, in my life at all times. Definitely. And what teams would you have followed? So obviously growing up, were you a United fan, a Liverpool fan? No, I was a Cork Celtic fan. Cork Celtic fan. Yeah. Cork Celtic played out of Turner's Cross, where I went to school, and uh, I've spent every blessed weekend when they were playing at home watching them. Never missed a match. I can even remember parking my bike uh, on the side of the ground at Turner's Cross, where the stand is nowadays. Yeah. Outside of that, there was a schoolboy entrance, a tiny little schoolboy entrance, and for, I think, three pence old money in those days, back in the 1960s, you could uh, have your bike minded by somebody. You go in and see the match, sit on the wall or wherever, get a nice place to sit. And the Cork Celtic team became my, my heroes, essentially. I got to know some of them afterwards. Uh, they were great characters. Um, Hibernians were the big, big opposition over in Flower Lodge. We hated Fla uh, Cork Hibernians, quite honestly. You know, they could not lose by enough. Uh, all we wanted was to see Celtic triumph. And eventually, in 1974, just before they went out of business, they actually won the League of Ireland. Uh, they won it with a team uh, containing an awful lot of very, very bright talents, like Alfie Hale, who'd been an Irish international from Watford, Ben Hannigan from Dublin played with them. There were many more as well. Uh, they, they packed the team with some great players. I remember even seeing George Best playing for Cork Celtic. He played, I think, three games. Yeah. Um, didn't do an awful lot, but maybe added an extra couple of thousand people to the gate. You, know? you always see that famous picture, he comes out through the dugout, yeah. and you always hear the stories that he's at the train station, he's having a few points as well. Right there. <laughs> like great stories. And obviously, Gerald, look, it's, it's, we know you played a bit of gap. You were yeah. more of a football man than a hurling man. Yeah. But obviously, look, the Bears back then were, um, as you see, iconic. You know, the North Mom was famous for the Hearty Cup, yeah. but the Bears were definitely the club when it came to the hurling and the football, weren't they? Yeah, I was I was at school in Turner's Grass, and then I went to Colossus de Chris Reed, the secondary school there. And the guy I sat next to was a fellow called John Cotter. Uh, John's dad was a famous actor uh, who used to perform in the uh, in the pantomimes and in some of the other carry on, not carry on, but well, the up corks or something, whatever they were called them at that stage. Uh, there were big shows anyway. He was a great comedian. And John said to me one day, why don't you come out and play with us at the bars? So I did, and that's the reason I went out there um, and enjoyed it enormously. There was a very young Jimmy Barry Murphy part of the squad as well. Jimmy was a couple of years younger, a very, very nice young lad. Uh, he never changed. He was always the nicest of nice guys. Uh, recently, I was doing a charity match in Newbridge. It was called Hurling for Cancer. Yeah. It involved Jim Bolger's hurling team and uh, who else was there? Uh, the jockey from Yall. Uh, Davy Russell, maybe? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Davy's team. And Jimmy Barry was one of the referees. I was slagging him off because he wasn't blowing <laughs> the whistle. But he is an absolutely amazing guy, you know? Did he show the potential earlier on? Did you oh, know yeah. he could be one of the greats? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, it was effortless on his yeah. part, you know? I mean, he, he could play any sport. He did play sport. He played for Cork Celtic as well, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he, he, he could have excelled at anything. And did. And did, yeah. yeah. And, and the genetics are there. Look, Brian Barry Murphy had a nice little career yeah. in England as well, so yeah. Yeah. it just goes to show. We used to follow Brian's uh, fortunes when he was managing, and uh, I think he was with Rochdale for a while. He was, yeah. And really, you know, when you're when you're managing at that level, mm. oh, it's, it's like trying to win the lottery, you know. There's no money to buy players. So the end result is you struggle towards the bottom of the league. Uh, it's all about money, basically, there. 
Uh, and now I think he is coaching with uh, Manchester City, and yeah. that's great for him. He's a lovely lad. He used to come when when um, when we started in RTE to bring in co-commentators. Jimmy was one of the first. Jimmy came in in 1991, doing hurling with us, and he stayed three years. He was brilliant at it. Uh, and Brian Barry Murphy came to all of the matches with him. And really? So drowned in the car, you know. And like he's doing when Man City look great at club, mm. it's definitely a big future for Brian as well, no yeah. doubt. Now, Joe, we, we have to talk about obviously the transition radio TV. Did you have an obsession with radio like as a, as a teenager? Because look, I remember growing up, and I, I when it comes to BBC, I was obsessed. I'd have all the old recordings still. Mm. But did you have a look into the radio? Obviously, look, you listen to the games and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But was there a look in there from from the teens to maybe you want to do this in the near future? Oh, no, I never really thought in terms of doing it. Um, that didn't. No, that didn't really impact to any great extent. Um, when I was growing up as a youngster, radio was the thing. Because you, you must remember, back in the 1960s when I was a, a teenager, there was very little sport on television. I, I can tell you the amount of sport that was on television. We only had one channel anyway. We're living in Cork, so it's RTE. RTE, and there was no RT1 or RT2. RT2 did not come in until 1979 or thereabouts. So you're, you're talking about getting, you got five matches of GAA every year. One of those was on St. Patrick's Day, was the Railway Cup. Then you got the two, you got the semi-finals and you got the finals. And that was it. Where soccer is concerned, you got the FA Cup final. You might occasionally get the FAI Cup final as well. They seem to have had a contract to always show the Rugby International. So you saw, it was the Five Nations at that stage. So you got Ireland's four games uh, at the beginning of the year. Then RT did things like um, skating, uh, show jumping. But they were the only sports, so we grabbed onto those and we wanted to watch anything at all that looked like it was a sporty thing. So, you know, they were so few and far between, Jerry. And that's why we latched onto radio, because radio was ever present, it was always there. And it allowed you to feel that you were there, present at the at the occasion. I mean, I wasn't at certain All Ireland finals when I was a child because there's nobody to bring me there. Yeah. And yet I felt I was there. There was a, a there was a there was a down team back in 1960 and 61, and they won the All Irelands, and they were the first teams from the six counties to bring Sam Maguire over the border. You know, and I remember listening to the commentaries of those games when I was a kid. And later on, I met a couple of the players who played in those. And I almost felt I was there and I had seen, there was a guy called Paddy Dart. He was a great free taker. Uh, Sean O'Neill was a brilliant full forward for them. I almost felt I knew these guys from just the radio, you know, when I was only a child. Uh, so radio was super important in those days, you know. And Joe, look, you've seen the like, Trojan Tro Obviously, look, we, we talk about the first game. And what was it like doing the first All Air? Because the first one I did was in Irish. Uh, I had joined RT TV in 1980. That's two years after I started in radio. And that came about because in 1979, I was again doing the local radio commentary on the uh, Cork County football or hurling final. I'm not quite sure which one. And it was a day when. Uh, Radio 1, or Radio Sport, whatever it was called then, they had a match which was in the National League. The National League was played before Christmas in those days. And the game was called off because of the weather conditions. Yeah. So in RT somebody said, have we any other game anywhere where we can literally take a commentary from it? So they took the commentary from Cork. They only broke away for a short period to take the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, which was on in Longchamp in Paris the same afternoon. Otherwise, it was our commentary, and I did it, if, I, if it was the hurling one, I would have done it with Paddy Barry, who was a great character, a wonderful man, uh, still is. Um, I'm very, very fond of Paddy, and I was in Porky Cueve a couple of years ago for a special night for him yeah. by St. Vincent's, because yeah, yeah. he's a treasured member of the club. Um, but somebody, one of the bosses in RT heard this and said, will you come up, we'd like to talk to you. And he became my, my head of sport eventually, Tim O'Connor. Um, and I started working in 1980 on TV uh, and the following year RT decided they would, they would do the All-Ireland Final in Irish on RTE2, which is now there. 
it was pretty straightforward um, insofar as Michael O'Hare was doing the English language commentary on RT1 and I sat alongside him in the next booth for RT2. And I literally was told, look, you've got to call, I think it was, it was Galway versus Offaly, you've got to call the players by their Irish names. That is taken. Now, by comparison, nowadays on TG Car, they use the names that the guys go by. If it's John Murphy, it's John Murphy rather than Sean O'Murrico, you know? Yeah. But I had to learn that John Connolly, who played for Galway, was Sean O'Connella and all the rest of it, you know? Uh, Niall McInerney was the full back and he was a guy called Neil McInerney. That was the <laughs> Irish. So in the week before the game, I had to go and learn their Irish names. I also went down to the Gwaeltucht and I immersed myself there for about a week so that I was thinking Irish when it came to the job. And that was my first All-Ireland final. In, it was in Irish and it was 1981 and I did three in all before my first English language one which was in 1985. Yeah, that was a nerve wracker all right because now you knew uh, the audience was going to be so much larger, you know? Definitely. And John, I can only imagine with the technology today compared to 1985 it's a different story. There was probably no phones, no mobile no, phones, definitely. No. Internet wasn't a thing. Uh-uh. So, like, you know what I mean? The research is different. They know we have Wikipedia, we have so many yeah. things that will tell us the facts. Yeah. So, how did you find? Obviously, there were sleepless nights, obviously, you were up till, you know, whatever time in the morning to get stuff ready, but how did you find that transition? Well, at those, in those days, you could go to the training sessions in the week before the game, and there was no problem whatsoever getting in and, and finding out exactly everything you needed to know about the players. The, three years earlier than that, in 1982, I was sent to my first World Cup in soccer, and that was to Spain. And that was much more difficult because I was going to be going there as one of RT's two commentators, the other man being Jimmy McGee. Jimmy was the main man. I was very young, really, at this stage, um, just about 30, and um, it, it was a completely new departure. I'd never been to Spain before, you know? And now suddenly here I was, and I was doing 15 to 20 matches at the World Cup. And as you say, technology was not what it is today, so you didn't have the internet. You didn't also have much football on TV. So I wasn't able to see Spain, I think Spain were in my first match. I wasn't able to see them play before watching them in the flesh, literally, in the first game. No, the first game wasn't Spain, the first game was actually in Seville on a steamingly hot night uh, and it was a game between Brazil and Russia and it was, I mean Brazil were just fantastic yeah. but they didn't win that all, that uh, World Cup in 82 it was won by, by Italy you know um, but you know there was a lot of problems building up to it because I had nobody to bounce off and ask what is the correct pronunciation of this or that the end result was when I went to the World Cup I would probably get myself to the grounds about six hours before the match started and go around then pestering people, asking them, how do you pronounce that? Tell me something about this if you can. I mean, they've got their jobs to do as well. People are very helpful, but at the same time, you can't intrude too much, you know? Of course. But I mean, a simple little example. There was a Spanish club, which we now know to be in the Basque region, and we call it Real Sociedad. And they had a player there. But if you look at the spelling of it, it's S-O-C-I-A-C-A-D-A-D, something like that. I'm spelling it incorrectly. But I wasn't sure, was it Sociedad or Sociedad or what it was. Now every kid who's into soccer knows exactly because they're listening to it. I mean... Some children nowadays know more about the Liverpool reserve team than they do about their, their local club team because it's everywhere, it's wall to wall as we know, you know. Of course, it's different. And like, as you say, over 80 all Ireland, you know what I mean, World Cups, you know, we, we've seen you do the basketball, um, you know what I mean, there's, there's been so many things you've added to that list over the years, Joe, but for you, what, what did you find the most interesting? Obviously, look, I've seen you on TV, Ray Houghton, you know, all the greats throughout the years. I remember one day, been in college on a Monday morning and watching you with Rafael Benitez a few days prior in, in <laughs> Liverpool. Like, what, what parts do you enjoy most? Obviously, look, commentating's a fantastic part. Interviews is always a pleasure afterwards. But you know, like, did you enjoy the World Cups? You know, like, obviously, oh, being absolutely. It's incredible. It's a yeah. I've, I've done. I don't know how many World Cups I've done. Um, I'm not doing this one, but because Martin has enough commentators, and, and and I can just concentrate on my own stuff, which is GAA. Yeah. But. Um, I did that 82 one. The funny one, the next one, 86, I was now doing more GAA than I had been in 82, so they were reluctant to let me go out to Mexico. Um, But then a funny thing happened. Um, The first night 
of the Mexico World Cup in 1986, the lines were very bad, the sound quality was very poor. And before the match was over, the man who was in charge of the coverage, a fellow called Mike Horgan, was on the phone to me saying, could you get your butt up here to Dublin uh, tomorrow? Because we're very, very unhappy about the quality of the sound lines coming out of Mexico, and we want you to sit in the studio, and if the lines go down, you're going to pick up the commentary, and you're going to commentate on it from Dublin. So I thought, oh my sweet Lord, I have no preparation done whatsoever. It's not something I'm doing. I'm casually interested in it. I'll watch the match. So I spent the next two weeks of the 1986 World Cup sitting in the studio twice a day, having all my notes written out and done out in case the lines broke down. Mercifully, the lines never broke <laughs> down. So, you know, I had, I, I don't think Dunphy and Giles were there at that stage. Maybe they were, but I, I, I have a recollection of uh, uh, one or two other people who would have been uh, studio guests at that stage. Bill O'Hurley would have been anchoring it. Liam Nolan was involved as well. Um, so, w w World Cups like that. I went to the World Cup in, in, in Italy. Um, I went to the World Cup in, um, where else? Where's the next one? Uh, 1992 90, 90, uh, was... Barcelona. Barcelona was the Olympics. I did. I'm mixing them up between the Olympics and and um, and the World Cups. The Olympics are a great experience as well. I would have done five or six of those at the venue, and some of them from studio, you know. But uh, you, to answer your question, which was about five minutes ago, <laughs> uh, commentary is what I prefer to do, you know. To do. Yeah. And, and Charlie, like, you know, like you've been part of history when it when it comes to like you know Michael not. Michael Crew, you know, ninety two Olympics. Paul, Paul Butterbur be always telling me stories. Okay, he was there and he remembers. You know what I mean, the stories and stuff. But you've encountered so many people throughout the years, there. Um, like you know, you've worked with so many great people. Like who did you enjoy working with throughout the years? Obviously, look, there's so many legends. You mentioned Bill, and like mm. they're all iconic, all these guys, including yourself. But like who did oh, you enjoy? Of course, uh, Bill. Bill is Bill was an absolutely terrific guy. I, I was very fortunate to work with an awful lot of great people. Jimmy McGee is one of the greats of our business. Jimmy was very supportive, very nice man. Um, I've worked alongside George Hamilton for most of the last 40 years. Um, George is the best sports commentator RT has ever produced, without a shred of doubt in my mind. Um, and I've said it to him, uh, and I'd, I'd wish everybody else to know as well. Uh, he is held in, in awe by an awful lot of people. If you watched the most recent game that he did which was the women's international game where they beat Scotland 1-0 yeah. and George was in, on commentary that was absolutely masterful unbelievably good um, he's, he's as good and as strong now as he ever was um, when it comes to uh, people who I've worked alongside as, as co-commentators I mean I've worked alongside Michael Dignan quite a bit in hurling Michael's a smashing guy his knowledge of of hurling is, is just unparalleled, you know. He calls it as it is. Yeah. Um, he, he just knows the game inside out, you know. I've been fortunate to work with great people in football as well, Kevin McStay, Martin Carney from, from County Mayo. Um, I, I worked with an awful lot of brilliant people. In soccer, I, you talk about being in awe of people. I can remember the first time I started working with John Giles. It was in Old Trafford. Uh, do you remember the disaster that happened in Hillsborough? I do. Right. I do. The replay of that game, which was Liverpool against Nottingham Forest, wasn't it? Um, was yeah, it? it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 The replay of that game, because the game was abandoned, the replay of it was a couple of weeks later in Old Trafford. It was about, it took place at around half 12 or 12 o'clock. It was lunchtime-ish anyway. And that was my first time being sent over to work alongside Giles. And I worked with him for about five or six or seven years. Got to know him very, very well. He's an absolutely brilliant guy, a really brilliant guy. Uh, but I remember um, one of the stalwarts of Coke Ramblers, um, George Mellerick, uh, George a great footballer. George said, you lucky devil, you. <laughs> that's a guy I've absolutely idolised all my life and here you are every Saturday afternoon sitting down and you're working alongside the guy you know um, I didn't have anybody working with me on one of the most tragic moments in, in my life uh, working 
on in this business, and that was in Heysel. Do you remember Heysel? Eighty five, I think. Yes. Yeah. Twenty ninth of May, nineteen eighty five. That's where thirty nine people died, uh, and I was sent over at the last minute to cover that game because George's. George's dad was dying and he died later that week so George couldn't go and I was teaching at the time and um, I got a phone call at work on the Monday and um, again it's this guy Mike Corgan who sadly passed away recently uh, said to me look um, could you is there a possibility and um, I said well I'll ask I'll see now, there were other problems as well because my wife had only just given birth to our daughter the previous Friday. Well, I shouldn't have been going anywhere next I or near Heysel yeah. for a football match. Um, I didn't even know who Liverpool were playing. That's how bad it was. I remember going into Easton's and buying a shoot magazine to find out who are they playing, what do they look like, I probably wasn't even pronouncing Juventus the right way. I was probably saying Juventus, Juventus. until somebody corrected me, you know. Um, but I flew out of Cork on the Wednesday morning. Um, my wife said, yeah, go on, go ahead. We're OK. And um, I went to London and then I sat into a plane from London to Brussels and the guy alongside me was actually Ian St. John. Do you remember him at all? Yeah, Liverpool St. Legend. St. and Greaves, he used to be on TV years ago. Mm. Uh, we didn't exchange any conversation. I knew who he was. He didn't have a clue who I was. Uh, I wasn't going to bother him. But I got there anyway to Brussels, and it was a lovely, warm, sunny uh, May evening. Very hot. Got in a bus, travelled towards the ground. Uh, didn't even make it to a hotel. Hadn't a clue where I was going to be spending the night because I had to spend the night somewhere. Um, there were people drinking on the streets um, as per normal. It was a holiday type atmosphere. Everybody looked to be in great humour. You had um, just Liverpool fans everywhere, Juventus fans, big huge banners and flags. Got to the ground uh, and before the match there was a, a schools game on. So it reminded me of kind of like the, the minor game in a Croke Park afternoon and you had the Reds against the Whites and everything looked fine and then suddenly round about a half an hour before the game was due to start um, I saw people in the Liverpool section behind the goal now there was, this was crazy the old high Stadium was a relic of disaster a crazy old place yeah. shouldn't have ever been there but behind the goal you had two sections with a cordon of police down the middle segregating them. You had Liverpool, you had Juventus. And for whatever reason I don't know, the live some Liverpool fans, and this was very strange because Liverpool had a great reputation. They travelled well, they very rarely caused any bother whatsoever. But some of them started firing missiles, stones, anything they could find. And this was a wretched old ground, probably falling apart easy enough to pick up masonry and just fling it at somebody. Maybe you thought it was just a lark or whatever, it was stupid, it was crazy. And of course the Juventus fans then tried to get out of the way of the missiles and as they went to their side, to this side, the wall at the end of it collapsed. And the next thing I noticed was that there were people using bits of scaffolding and they were carrying bodies out into the middle of the field and before we knew it, the game was held up and, look, the rest is history anyway. But I was on my own that night. There was no co-com. Um, Brendan O'Reilly, the late Brendan, was anchoring it in studio. He had no panel. So uh, it was a case of keep on talking, Ger, for an hour and a half. And please God, the match will start sometime or other, you know. And it did. And eventually... The game was over, I think Juventus won it, and myself and Mike Corgan, who was the producer, Mike used to come, go off and he'd bring me back slips of paper, and I remember the first one he brought back, we think there are casualties, then he went off and he got some more, and he says, it now looks like there are seven dead, and before I knew it, it was 13, and then 21, and the end tally, as I said, was 39. Madness. Yeah, it was madness. Um, prior to that... Um, 
RT were just employing me on a match by match basis. And eventually after that they decided they'd give me a contract. That was the first time I got a contract. <laughs> and like as you said, you looked at the rest is history, you know, you are still active. Yeah. Many, many more years. The batteries I mean? are still being charged every night. Yeah, you look fresh as a daisy, I always <laughs> say that about you. But like we, we have to get to some some pinpoints, Charlie. You've covered so many all Irelands, you know, when it comes to hurling and football and, and in general, look we you're Mr. Ga, I always say that. Oh. Like for you, can one you pick? Like, there's, there's been so many all Irelands. Can you pick one? What, what's been the best? You know, like there's been so many great it's, games. It's it's it's, 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 uh, it's it's impossible, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, we're talking in my case of over four decades. You yeah. know, um, I I must say I always did. Uh, if it's football, I always did enjoy any matches that were there between Kerry and Tyrone. They were particularly special. I think the two thousand and eight final was a great final. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things about it, actually. Mickey Hart and Mickey had issues with RTE later on and I'm not going into them but I do remember uh, before the game Tyrone arrived around half past two and Michal O'Marherty was doing the radio and I was doing the TV we were down by the dressing rooms Mickey was getting out of the coach he was going in and we stopped him and said can you just tell us are there any changes to your team and Mickey said I'll tell you what lads I'll be out soon and he went back in with the, the squad into the dressing room and Michal and myself stayed outside uh, because we trusted him and he came out 15 minutes later and he said he's not playing and he's not playing and numbers whatever it was 17 and 19 are coming in in their stead and I always thought fair play to you because of all the times I've been doing all Ireland finals for somebody on a day when they're up to high dough to come out to t think in terms of the two guys outside who need the information uh, very, very few people do that. I can tell you that much. I actually met Mickey a few times, and he's he's, he's kind of like a very quiet character. Yes. But as you say, he's one of, one of the greats. You know what I mean? Yes. He's a true, true legend of the game. And like, you know what I mean? As you said earlier, like, when we talk about obviously starting in the late seventies to to now, there's been such a transition. You know what I mean? Times have changed. You know what I mean? There's been four decades, as you say. Mm. Why is that passion still there? Because obviously, look, you. I know you love the game and you love sports yeah. in general, but it's. Isn't it so different now to, to then? It's it's you know what I mean. Like when you look at icons, like it's very rare you see um, a new icon today. It's always the legends of before. So tell oh, us, like you know, I, I always no, I, I don't think that approach, Jerry. I, I'm not. I don't necessarily look for icons. Um, there are great memories, but I mean, the, the the current batch of players will make their own memories. I was at a match last weekend where I was working in Tralee and it was two district teams playing in the Kerry County semi-final. A couple of thousand people were there. But I go with the approach that you never know when you go to a game that you may see the greatest goal that's ever been scored, the greatest save made by a goalkeeper, the best pass, the nicest bit of skill in the middle of the field. And I saw some great play in that match, even though people said I wasn't much of a game. And it wasn't much of a game. One team was much better than the other. Well, I still saw two or three individuals there uh, and it, just to see them in action was worthwhile for me and that's what I enjoy watching I, I just enjoy people's ability they have what I have not got and never had um, and I could never play the game at that level um, I loved hurling I mean I haven't mentioned hurling here but the, some of the great Kilkenny Tipperary uh, hurling matches they're legends we, we talk in terms of El Clasico in, um, in Spain, you know, Real Madrid and Barcelona. But I mean, Kilkenny Tipperary matches have been fantastic games. Yeah. It's been great watching Cork. I always remember the double year in 1990. That was so special, you know. Um, but there have been lots. Dublin six in a row, for instance. You know, I was fortunate enough to work on, on all of those. Yeah. Saw some brilliant players uh, doing some wonderful things. Exciting. I mean, sport is exciting. That's the great thing about life. You can, I mean, I'm, we're, I, I regard sport and what we do on television as part of the entertainment industry. Some people, and I've had this discussion with some of my, my colleagues, some people see it as, as a news event. It's news, it makes the news if such and such a team wins and such and such a team doesn't. Uh, but to me, it's entertainment. And these are amateur players who are entertaining us, which yeah. is phenomenal. Really, it is phenomenal. You know? And the time they give up as well, you know what I mean? Yes, the, yeah, the training that they're putting in. Um, it's, it's something, it's, it's a lifestyle choice. It has to be. I remember talking to John Kiley a few years ago, just before the pandemic, a uh, man I greatly admire, the Limerick manager, 
and he was saying, you know, he, he was just amazed when he went back into management and the time that these fellows are putting in. There are group sessions and then there are individual sessions. It's just astonishing. It's, it's, a, it's a six or seven day week thing. Yeah. Um, and I find it, it I, I was watching some players in action over the weekend, a game, one or two games I was not working on, but I was observing, and some of the, 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 the leading lights, and I don't know how they're going to keep going, because their season, their year is so long, and they're going from the inter-county season, which now begins in January, into the club season, which is in the autumn, and into the winter, and still they're being expected to produce performances that were as good as they were six, seven, eight, nine, ten months ago. And that's asking too much of amateur players. Yeah. It wouldn't happen in a professional environment where they are, forget about the paid bit, that's immaterial in some respects, but the, play, the players who are paid, after they train for two or three hours or less, they can go home, they can have a rest in the afternoon. I mentioned Johnny Giles earlier on. When I've been, been away with John, John would say, I'm going for a kip, because when he was a Leeds United player, that's what they did. They had a kip, and he calls it a kip, every afternoon. And I think he's still probably doing it, you know? He does. He was, he was a hardy. We remember interviewing Johnny Giles and Bobby Tamlin came in. We, we, we were just sitting on Bobby, just jumped in for the interview, and it was iconic. But like, I remember being starstruck, you know? Like, you know, he's a Leeds legend, you know, an mm. Irish legend. One of the true greats of the game, and even a better pundit. He, people like people would always say when you had Dunphy, you know, Giles, Bill, it was iconic. Yeah. That that you know, I mean, they were, they were so good. Sure. And Dunphy then as well, you know, having a rant, sure. it was it was yeah, great yeah, times. Yeah. Uh, for your questions, Dora, we have to ask you. Right, this is just off my own back. Did you ever think about bringing out a book? No, Michael, you know, Michal, no. never thought about bringing out a book. No, because uh, I don't want to bore people. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, kidding you here I, I don't think I have anything of any interest to tell anybody I really don't and I don't want to there are too many boring books out there anyway not a lot, not a lot. I think I think a book would be a great idea um, look obviously you've been committed to RT for so many decades right mm. was there any, any opportunities to go out to England and work with BBC look I know that sometimes you can you know you can no, contribute I, was, stuff. I, would, I would never have been good enough you think so, so? no I would never been good enough no no I'm surprised. I, I think you would be, but look, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with my lot. You know, perfectly yeah. happy. I've had a very listen. I'm, I'm married to Yvonne. I've got three adult children. I've two grandchildren. I'm exceedingly happy with my lot. I thank God that I've lasted as long as I have lasted. And look, it's in the lap of the gods. What happens next? I respect that. No. What would your canon be doing without radio or TV? So if you if you didn't go into that avenue, didn't go into radio or TV, do you reckon you'd still be teaching? Do you reckon it'd be the case of? I, I probably would have been uh, teaching. I probably would have continued teaching. I also probably would have made more money um, because uh, I largely work. I essentially work for myself. Yeah. In that, I'm under contract to do a certain amount, but uh, there's no pension attached to all of that. It's not like uh, I can knock off at 65 and say, that's it, goodbye, good luck. Um, if I were teaching, my salary would have been greater and there would have been a pension to, uh, which would have kicked in uh, at a certain stage of my life. But it, it's not to be. I've just, my, my family have been so good to enable me, to allow me to just go and pursue my dream in this respect. And they've support, supported me every step of the way. It's been brilliant and I'm so grateful to them all for doing so. And you speak of a dream, Dora. Obviously, look, you, you've accomplished so much. But look, you never would have thought, I suppose, like, you know, back in the 70s, that, look, all the World Cups, the Olympics. Oh, no, the, no not it's, at all. Listen, when I was a kid at school in Colossus Grace Reed, I wouldn't have even been noticed. Wouldn't have even been noticed. I was an average kid. The only funny thing that I did in Grace Reed, which I think uh, I'd love to have had a photograph of it, I don't know if anybody has. In my final year in Grace Reed, um, we there were Kayleys on a Sunday night, okay. So I played, I played an accordion. We had an, a piano player, and we had a drummer, and the three of us were the people who provided the music, and the gang danced away. The pianist was a guy called Cahill Dunn. He sang for Ireland in the Eurovision Song Contest. The drummer was a fellow called Morris O'Donoghue, O'Donoh O'Donoh and Morris was the other priest on Craggy Island in Father Ted, oh, yeah. the yeah. one who was always uh, annoying Father Ted. Yeah. Well, the three of us ended up doing kind of crazy things in life, uh, and yet back then, in those Leaving Cert days, 
nobody would have thought that any of the three of us would have done anything of any use. It's my only thing about that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a re- uh, we have to also mention, Joe, look, what's the future hold for Joe Cannon? Look, there's no stone you don't. It's, it's, it's fair to say that. Look, obviously, you still have big projects, big goals. What can we expect for the next few years? Any, any? I'm looking forward to seeing my grandchildren who are age five and a half, Ethan and Ben, uh, become corner forward for Dublin. That's what I'm looking forward to. Dublin. I love that. <laughs> and we have to ask the last of all, look, we have to mention Cork. Yeah. You're a Cork man, right? Obviously, look, we haven't won the All Ireland when it comes to hurling and football for a very long time. Oh, it's the longest it's ever been, Jerry. The it's longest it's ever been. I can remember in 1966 being a teenager and the welcome back that the McCarthy Cup got when a 19 year old Gerald McCarthy from the bars captained the team to beat Kilkenny in that final. And the celebration in Cork afterwards, it had been 12 years since they had won it previously. Now they haven't won it since 2005. So as we head into 2023, it's getting longer and longer and longer. When it's brought back eventually, as it will be, the celebration in Patrick Street and the Grand Parade in the South Mall will be such that it will go on for hour after hour after hour, day after day and probably week after week. It will be the biggest celebration of a sporting event ever, ever in Cork, I'm certain. And I think it could happen, Jerry, in hurling within the next two years. I have that feeling. I think the young lads are there. I think the omens are good. I, I just sense it. I just sense it. Within two years, I think Cork will be All Ireland hurling champions. We hope so, Jer. We hope so. Jer, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time, sir. Take care, Jer. We Jerry. appreciate it. Be sure to check out and support all our media partners, Sports Matters, bringing the sports home.